The, the biggest challenge I, I see is people are taking in too many different sources of information. And that's hard. YouTube is a blessing and a curse. There's great information out there. What you're doing on your podcast is other great stuff out there. But you have to, you have to almost categorize what it is you are doing. Welcome back everyone. Today I'm sitting down with Ali Crooks, one of the traders I love to talk to for his experience. I think he's trading since 2002, I believe, which is a long time ago. So we're looking forward to having you in the podcast again. Talk about your experience in trading, managing funds, and a lot more are coming. So Ali, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? Thanks for having me on. Congratulations on on your YouTube uh, YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, it's great to be back. Thank you. Yeah, good to have you back for sure. I want to kind of do a quick update since we last spoke. I think it's been a few months, and I can't remember exactly when, but. Tell me what's been going on for you in the last few months. Like, what's what's new? What's what's changed? Yeah. So, um, well, it's, it's more of the same, really, from my side. But um, the fund that I run, so the uh, regulated managed fund, that is just shy of three years that I've been doing that, and we broke the thirty percent mark on that, which is great. So, I've had some good learnings from that because I run the fund in terms of my trade applications, the trades I place, very similar to my own trades, but I manage the risk very differently because obviously I'm trading other people's money. So there's some big lessons from that. Um, uh, this month, so May, has actually been my biggest, I had my biggest cash winning week that I've ever had. So that was a real, uh, a really, well, a good week from a profitability point of view, but there's some good lessons from that. And we've just revamped one of the trainings that I'm running. So our four pillars training used to be called the Kickstart training. We've revamped that. And uh, we've moved house again. So we've been busy. Yeah, lots going on, but uh, really just building on what what I've been doing, you know, for the last year, the last five, ten years, really. Every time we talk, you've been like moving or close to moving, so it's interesting to hear. Yeah, it's the trade lifestyle, isn't it? If you can do it, why not? You know, if you can, why not? You know, experience some different. Every sport. year since uh, many many years, I still like it. So yeah, it's definitely a good thing. Yeah, it's cool. Cool. So you mentioned something interesting, which is the best cash winning week you've had a few weeks back, I believe. So tell us about kind of how that went and what do you think makes this the best winning week and kind of the, the result of it? I'd like, I think I'll break the illusion that I didn't, I didn't do anything mystical or magical or didn't really, you know, it was, it was no different than some of the trades I've had in the past, but it was the combination of two positions, one that I've been holding since early April and one that I took right at the start of uh, of May. And on that particular strategy, I have a trading stock management system that I run. And essentially all that happened was the trade ran and ran and ran and ran. And then when it reaches a certain point, I have a fixed target on it. So it's quite a mechanical based um, trade management system on it. But it's the combination of the account growing, my, my, my account's growing over time, and that particular account has got the most amount of money in. And it's really a lesson in chipping away. So that's the first time that I've had a plus 12R reward ratio on that trade for the best part of three years. It's ticked around an average of about four, but some of the trades run big. And this was two of the trades managed to run big in one in one go. So it looks great. And I think the biggest lesson and that any of our traders can take, regardless of the size of the account, is that, yes, it was a big R value and an even bigger cash value, but not to get addicted to things like that. You know, this, these trades don't happen. If you look at the statistics, these trades will happen on average once every 18 months. Two of them came at once. And it's the first time I've had two big wins on that strategy for the best part of probably nearly two years. So there's patience involved in that as well. And the chipping away of the combination and the compounding of the other strategies that I run in that account. But this particular strategy hit, hit big. Um, you know, some traders won't trade that way. They'll have a fixed R, they'll have a fixed target on every trade that they place. I combine the two. Some of my strategies are fixed targets. Some of them are variable targets. Some of them have trailing stops. Some of them have, you know, limit orders. So the way that I trade each strategy in terms of its exit point is different. But I still had to hold them. The trade went the trade went against me four times. And I think another big lesson is I was short oil at the time when all I was seeing in the news was everybody talking about the fact that we were going into May. May statistically is when oil goes up in up in price. And anybody that's shorting oil would be would be a fool right now. A lot of the analysts were very much very bullish at that point. And I think the lesson for your listeners is if you've got a particular trade that you're in and you've got a, a view and you're in that position, you've got to stick to your guns. You know, it'd be easy. It would have been easy for me to cash out a little bit early or worry about hearing something in the news and change my mind. 
and that strategy's got a specific plan. So you've got to stick to that plan, whether it's a 70 grand winning trade or, a, um, a, you know, a 700 dollar winning trade. It doesn't matter. The, the money is immaterial. It's how you operate. And I always say to the traders, if you want to get to those big numbers, you've got to be able to trade with discipline when the numbers are much smaller. A lot of traders almost say, oh, I'll, I'll be disciplined when I get, you know, when I've got more money. It's like, you won't, you know, if, you, if you're not disciplined with a $7,000 trading account, you won't be disciplined with a $700,000 trading account. But it's also a good lesson in terms of people expect that they'll get a paycheck from trading in the same returns every week. If you make like 20% a year, it's going to be 5% every month without fault. But there's going to be ups and downs. Like you mentioned, you can have like a really, really good month. Then a month where you're using money a little bit, then a month where you make just a small amount of money. It's not like a fixed paycheck you get every single week or every single month, basically. Exactly. It's, I like, um, I echo the same words is that the paycheck mindset is, and also the word average. I think I think a lot of traders, when they hear this av average of 5% a month, they almost subconsciously think that they're going to just have a 5% month every single month. And for swing trading, and I see the same with day trading, but as a swing trader myself, it doesn't work like that. So I made no, I made no money. In, I was, I think, it was down about two percent in the first quarter of the year, and then I went down at the start of April as well. So if you looked at my P and L from the start of the year up until about two weeks ago, I was down two percent. But then I've made it back, and I've had other winning trades since then as well. So you have to be willing to, as you said, have that fluctuation and get away from the paycheck, you know, paycheck mindset. And now we've got two kind of mindset issues there. So we got the the, the issue of being able to kind of deal with the losses and keep going until you get to these these wins later but the other issue is when you have a win like a, a really good month or a really good week how do you kind of maintain the consistency after that good winning week or good winning month to kind of stay at the same level very good point the the, the, the phrase that i like to use is i lean on the data so when i have any form of extreme in my trading so i'm very big on random distribution is you know the trades are going to fall in a way in the future differently than they have in the past but the data that you have on your strategy be it live data back tested data or combination of the two will show you the patterns so if i have a winning month like that the first thing i did was go back and look at the data and look how regularly does that happen well it's on average once every 18 months that i have though i have a big win like that look at my live data and historical data so i don't get carried away because even though i've been trading 20 years it's very easy to in that situation get a little bit carried away, or as I say, get a little bit loose with your analysis on your next setup. So it's not actually that winning trade. You stuck two rules, you've done your thing on that trade, but it's the next few trades where you're vulnerable because you end up feeling a little bit more um, at ease, a little bit more loose, a little bit more cocky. So for me, I always lean on the data to get an idea of what has just happened, be it positive like that was, or if I'm going through a drawdown period, because that will help me get some perspective because when you're in it it can feel like it's been happening for a long time whether it's a winning trade or a winning period you can almost forget that go back two months and you were going through a drawdown or vice versa you're going through a drawdown and it's very hard to remember that two months ago you had your best two months so i will remind myself by leaning on the data to look and see where what has just happened fits in on the bigger picture because that's for me is what I'm, I'm all about the bigger picture in terms of the results because I know that I'm going to fall foul e to recency bias. Yes, my my recency bias um, levels are probably less than a new trader, but it's still there. You know, we, we, we you know we we short we we think short term as human beings naturally, and our defense mechanisms can, can kick in. I've I've worked with traders that have had a really good quarter, and then they actually tighten up. They do the opposite. They don't get loose. They actually tighten up because they want to hold on to the profits they've got. And then they actually become worried about taking the next couple of trades. Whereas some go, ah, oh, just made a load of money. And then they're, you know, they're, they're footloose, they're fancy free. So for me, it's very important to lean on the data, but also get an idea of how you're operating. Journaling is really, really crucial in the scenario. You know? What are some things you journal about in, in those cases? Are, are there some questions you ask yourself specifically, or is it just like, a kind of like a free flow writing or how do you do that so i i personally tend to do it's it's a it's a weird form of shorthand so i tend to ask three questions is have i lent on the data which is a yes or no answer so when i'm going through something that is less than the, the norm so an extreme winning period extreme losing period have i lent on the data have i got some 
perspective. So it's like a yes or no answer. And then what I do is I tend to write down almost shorthand any emotions that I'm feeling about the trade. So if let's say, for example, we take those couple of trades, went against me three, three or four times before it actually rolled over and started moving into profit. Um, so I will just journal if there's any emotion that keeps coming up. And for me, it was a little bit of uncertainty. I'd had, you know, I think my mindset was I was hoping for the winners, not necessarily the big winners, but just hoping for the winners because I'd had a, I'd had a, um, you know, a quiet previous quarter. And then I will also get uh, people that I work with, and I'll do this to journal, uh, almost make a note emotionally if there's things externally happening. So, have you got pressures from work? Are you traveling a lot? Are you tired? Is your health on point? Have you been eating bad? I mean, it can be all sorts of things. And I think that is especially important for day traders. If they're, if you're sat in front of your screen for any more than three hours a day, which I'm not because I'm swing trading, but if you're sat in front of your, your monitors for long periods of time, energy and focus is critical. And a lot of that is what's going on externally. So I'm looking at what emotion am I feeling about the trades and what emotion am I feeling in general? And I'll just shorthand it. And then at the end of a period, so at end of a week, if I was a day trader, end of a month or a quarter as a swing trader, I'll just go back and I even get some of my traders to do this on a spreadsheet, just in line with the trade. And I'll go back and I'll have a look and I'll almost be like a teacher and just it's almost circle with a red pen, things that keep coming up. So let's say it keeps coming up that you've got uh, an issue with your trade when it goes into drawdown. So you might write panic, drawdown. Want to, you know, you know, uncertainty, fearful trade is going against me. You keep seeing that over and over again. That's the primary thing to work on because the challenge a lot of traders have is you feel all different emotions about all different trades because each trade's doing something different at a different time. And you can't fix every single thing that you feel. But if there's a common thread, whether it's fear based, greed based, and what I also say is what is your loss response? So at the end of the trade, I have, what is your loss response? Do you tend to immediately think about getting into another trade or do you feel fearful and want to go back and overanalyze? So again, it's, it's there isn't an absolute formula to it, but what I like to do is get people to see if there's a common things that come out. So it's no good journaling one trade. It's no good journaling 10 trades. You've got to journal 50, 60 trades relevant to the time type of trading you're doing. And I think that that's where the benefit comes. For me personally, when I was when I was starting out, the big one for me was my loss response was if I had two losers in a morning period, I think I've mentioned this on, on, on previous episodes. If I had two losers in a morning period, my trade frequency was nearly always higher that day. So inevitably, the day would end up with six, five or six trades. And there was a correlation between the number of trades that I'd number of losers I'd had in the morning versus the total number of trades. Now, some days it was just because there were more trades happening that afternoon but the pattern was enough to make me go okay this is a subtle form of revenge trading and the thing that was going on in my head the the, the voice in my head was saying i just want to get back to break even so that was the kind of thing that went round and round and round i want break even i want to get back to break even and i used to visualize getting to the end of the day and relaxing because well at least i was back at break even and i didn't lose anything so that was the power of journaling for me all those years ago, I think it's sometimes harder for swing traders because they're in trades for longer. So, you know, the, the emotion can change, but it is worth tracking. It's, it, it really is. Um, simple things, I think I saw a post that you put up with um, just visuals, just classifying trades. There's good trades, bad trades. Um, simple things like, did you break uh, rule break trade? How many trades did you miss? Could there be something logistically happening? Like you're, you just, you're trying to day trade and you're just not spending enough time in front of your screens. There's kids, there's commitments. So rule break trades, missed trades, bad trades, simple categorization of the trade itself is, uh, is, is also very useful. It's a good reminder that we don't have to like write two paragraphs every single day about how we feel and our trades and stuff. We can be like, keep it very simple, like the way you do it, a few keywords, and then th that's kind of all, all you need to get a good picture of, of what needs to be worked on. So. Yeah. I think also sometimes people feel they almost there's a certain thing they should be feeling or doing. And actually, you've got to be able to just let go of that. And whatever, whatever it is at that time is really, is, is really valuable. How often do you take breaks from from trading? So do you have any any times where you decide to not trade? Is it based on the, the market context? 
let's say I'm guessing you moving house, you want to not trade for a couple of days, perhaps, or how do you decide that? Yeah. Me personally, um, and funnily enough, when we moved, um, Sarah, my wife, she moved and took the dogs two days before me because I wanted to, it was more for training with students, but I, I said, you go because there's important stuff happening in the markets. We've got trades and I want to be, I want to be around. And then I came two days later. My primary thing as a swing trader is you sh- you, 90% of the time you should be able to fit in your analysis, your orders using, um, you know, um, expert advisors for entries. We have some robots that help our traders get in on certain entries if they're not around. You should be able to fit that in pretty much whatever's going on. We had a couple of couple of big family issues a couple of years ago, health issues with, with Sarah, and I still carried on doing my analysis in the morning and in the evening and placing the trades because for me, it's only a short period of time that I have to do that. But as a day trader, it would be very different for me. I would say as a day trader, you would want to be you know, if you're moving house, then forget it. If you are, you know, away on holiday, forget it. Use that time to get a rest from the screens. But me personally, I tend to carry on pretty much most of the time. If I'm in London for the day, um, I'm going down to see a broker or I'm, I'm catching up with friends, I'll just use remote Google remote desktop because I've done, I'll have done the work in the morning and I've done the work. And I say to traders, it's all about how do you, if you segment your analysis and you segment your analysis versus your, trade execution and you can do that in a systematic way then tuesday wednesday thursday all i may do is look at specific markets to see whether orders need to be placed and just reassess that so i'm not actually having to do tons of analysis but i may use the weekend to catch up on my journaling review my journaling and do my my bigger time frame analysis because as a swing trader i don't need to be doing that real time in front of the screen so time management is a big one um but yeah personally i don't really take I don't really take breaks because I love it and I enjoy it. And it's not a huge burden on my time, the systems that the systems that I run. Yeah, definitely always do it. And if you can have the right routine around it and the right process to review a chart, like you said, on the weekend, perhaps, or like once a day in the morning, then you have the other time to just look for trades and just kind of wait for a step to, to come. That makes things a lot easier for sure. Yeah. And, and, and nobody's perfect. You, you know, your things will happen in your life. We were actually in London last week uh, for a conference and I just got up and you know different environment and didn't do the analysis that I normally would. And then I jumped, I, I took a break at, at lunchtime and went back and just did the review. So you know, nobody's perfect. And I think sometimes also people try and be too rigid and too perfect and don't allow a little bit of a little bit of uh, give in what they're in what they're doing. There's the other side though where people kind of are in the opposite where they kind of trade when they feel like it or they trade when they have time to trade. And that kind of brings other issues where it's definitely tougher to kind of gain some consistency that way because it's just like at the chart when you feel like being at the chart and it just kind of screws up your results in your equity curve. Um, I think you've raised a really good point. I, I get asked this a lot. Like um, I, I, I've only got Tuesdays and Thursdays that I could trade. What do you recommend? Well, um, it's all down to, well, what are you trading? Does that strategy need you to be trading four consistent mornings, four consistent days? You're picking a Tuesday and a Thursday. You've one got to know that data wise, you need to go and test that to see if there's actually an edge to that. Um, and like you said, a lot of traders, there isn't, they aren't even that consistent. And like you said, oh, I just feel like trading today. I'm like, you're kind of stacking the odds in your favor. I would be more for that trader ditching that and saying, right, I'm going to apply a swing trading system instead of saying, oh, you know, it's, I've got Tuesday afternoon free. I'm going to go and I'm going to go and trade. Yeah, it screws up their PL. I'm 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 dead against that sort of thing because you're you you're fighting the odds. You know, most most strategies that are consistent over the long term require the trader to be consistent in the application. And you know, little windows of opportunity are, um, I think you're creating a false expectation because you could come down, trade for that hour or two hours and smash it out the park. And then you think that's going to be the norm. So yeah, I don't I'm not keen either. Speaking of expectations, a lot of people believe that a good trader, or like someone managing a fund, managing like a decent amount of money, should be trading most of the day. They should spend time at the chart. That should be the main thing they do. That 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 they focus on for the day. I totally see this as being flawed by very far. But how do you combine these things of like trading and and you also have people with the Trader Support Club, which is the company you have for educating traders? How do you combine these things together of like the trading, the education, of course, all your other life on the side? How do you kind of combine all this together? 
it's certainly taken time to get uh, get good at that. The big one for me is time blocking. So some of you, some of your listeners may have heard of that. Is it the start of so the end at the start of a week or before the week starts? And I think this is key. Is I'll usually I'm not perfect, but I'll usually do this on a Sunday. Is I'll just simply go through and I'll block time in the calendar. So all the sessions that I do for our our higher level coaching guys, they're already they're already into the week, so I know when they're happening. Um, I know when my one-to-one coaching clients, they're all happening. I block out time to exercise. I block out time to do my analysis. And for me, um, there's a lot of stuff in the trading and personal development space about morning routines. For me, the first thing I do when I get up is I check my possible trade list. The first thing I do, I don't have a coffee. I don't go and meditate. I don't do any of that. First off, I check my trades because that's the number one priority for me. Then I might just chill with Sarah for half an hour because we want to catch up. I might I might go take the dogs for a walk. But my my non-negotiable, which again, I don't do every single time, but I'm I'm pretty effective 95% of the time. During the week, the first thing I do in the morning is check my possible trades, the last thing I do at night. So then I then I've covered any order amendments that need to happen, any analysis, and then everything else is time blocked. So for me that 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 is key and i actually think as a swing trader i've seen this before with traders is swing traders less is more and i think no matter how much you're doing a good question to ask is could i be doing a little bit less because the tendency is to try and control things and if you're a swing trader you don't know whether you're going to be in that trade for two days two weeks possibly longer and a lot of the time you sitting there staring at it and staring at it as a swing trader is only going to make things worse now, a day trader different. You may require you to sit solely in front of your screens. You might not be using automated entries or robots. So with that in mind, then again, you've got to time block that. I think also a lot of people will not let other people or circumstances around them know what they're doing. So one of the challenges I have with some of the students is um, they intend to go and back test an idea or a strategy they've got. And they in their head, they block out five hours on a Saturday to do it but they don't tell their partner, their wife, that that's what they want to do. And then invariably something else props up, they have other commitments. So not just blocking the, blocking it out on your diary, but letting people, you know, letting other people know that it's important. And then they'll often act then as the people that hold you accountable. Because when you're then not doing what you should be, they're like, I thought you said you were, you were, you were, you know, you were, you were, you're doing your analysis or doing your reviews. So that for me is, that for me has helped my organization because I, I typically, especially on the Trader Support Club side, I tend to overestimate what I can get done in a week. Um, I'll, I'll have a longer list than I can actually achieve. And the time blocking thing has been great because if you monitor that, you can start to see how long things take. And my guys that join me in the doing their swing analysis, I say it's probably going to take you an hour, hour and a half to go through all of the markets that we, we have on our watch list to determine your possible five or six that you track. But over a period of a year, you will get better and quicker at that analysis. And that analysis time might go from an hour down to 30 minutes. And some weeks, there's going to be more going on. So you're going to have to take longer on each market to determine whether that market is, is suitable for you know the next step in our, in our process. So you have to have a little bit of flex. But yeah, time blocking is a, a really useful tool to be able to manage, manage multiple, multiple things, day trading, swing trading, businesses, family, everything. I think one of the tough things with time blocking is it's kind of easy to kind of get stuck in the routine and the things you got to do today or this week. And it's tougher to like plan time for growth, for things you want to improve, for like processes you want to go through. And especially if you have a business, you want to grow that business, it's tough to plan time for that. Do you find it like difficult to plan time for growth or for like improving things? Or is it like part of your routine already? Yeah, I, I try and block, not just block time out, but I'll try and block certain days for certain things. So it's very easy. We, you know, we get back to every person that sends us an email, even if they're not a paying member. At some point, we'll do that. We've made these commitments. And it's very easy for me to log on to the support email, log on to the Telegram groups, and then I'm going to I'm going to be doing a good thing, which is re- you know is replying to people and helping people. But I will try and allocate time for that on certain days. So for me, growth and project work is usually on a Wednesday. So I don't have any any trainings on a Wednesday, no one-to-ones. So again, the first thing I'll do is get up, check what I'm doing here. Any other exercise or stuff that I want to do in the morning, I'll do that. But then usually Wednesday is where I'll I'll do that. So I try and allocate at least one 
one day or one afternoon a week that is focused on strategic growth of the business. What products are we going to create? What new things can we do? Um, how are we going to attract more people? Are there, you know, all those types of growth activities I try and do on a certain day. Um, and then I don't go anywhere near the other things because I then, then I'm, I'm, I'm in a rabbit hole. So yeah, it's just, it, it just takes time and everybody's different in how they, in how they work it. Yeah. And I think this works out really well for someone who has like a full-time job, a day job. They want to kind of trade in the evening or they want to find time to at least become good traders in the evening. They can kind of plan out things to do, either like a backlist thing or some other things. Like I mentioned, this works really well. I used to do this like back a few years ago, uh, kind of plan out my evenings after work to kind of work on, on trading. And it's been definitely a fun time and it definitely works well. So you can plan things you want to do and kind of know exactly what you got to do at, at what time. So it's a, a good thing to do for sure. I think it is. I, I say to my guys as well, if you can, if you can, Alec, if you can just do something, even if it's only 10 minutes in the morning, you'll probably find that you're more motivated to do more in the, in the evening. So the, the risk is, oh, well, I've only got 10 minutes. I'm like, well, okay, you might not be able to, you're not going to get to get into back testing or you're not going to necessarily be able to do a deep analysis, but what could you do in that 10 minutes? Could you just go in and double check your orders? Because I think for a lot of the guys that are working a job, what you did that was so smart is if you've allocated those tasks in the evening, it trading then becomes part of your identity. And I think so many guys, when they start out, they struggle with this I idea of they're this person that's learning about trading. And it's almost like trading's over here. But if they could, James Clear talks about this in Atomic Habits, is you, you don't want to lie to yourself and go, I'm a trader, I'm a trader, and say a mantra in the mirror because your brain is smarter and knows you're not. But if you can start to make your schedule look as though you are a trader, you'll take that identity on. It's amazing how quickly a habit will habit will will stick if you're consistent a lot enough with it in the early days. And I think it, it, that's that's key. And I but being very specific, like you sitting down and saying, right, this evening I'm going to be focused on this and this and this is really key because then it's very clear what you're doing rather than just going, oh, I'm just going to sit down and maybe do some analysis or you know maybe do some back testing but being really clear on what you're going to do is, is hugely important what do you think is the best time investment for a trader who wants to get profitable like what should they spend time on of course we know back testing uh, but a lot of people don't don't know what they should kind of be doing to become better traders should they like watch youtube video should they kind of like trade a strategy take some trades they kind of lost in terms of like what to do to become better yeah i think again it's dependent that there is a there is an element of flex in terms of how you trade so you know you might be using i think the problem is is the, the biggest challenge i i see is people are taking in too many different sources of information and um, that is that and that and that's hard youtube is a blessing and a curse there's great information out there what you're doing on your podcast there's other great stuff out there but you have to you have to almost categorize what it is you are doing so i always say to swing traders very often it's less is more there's a tendency that if something is not working out or you're going through a drawdown period try and add or change things too quickly so i would say the three things i get my guys to do is get get consistent at your your overall market analysis so if you're trading one market as a day trader get consistent at how you do that and the time you allocate to it if you're one of our swing traders and you're looking at say 30 markets and you're drilling down to you know pulling out four or five that meet a certain condition Practice that skill. Tony, think, right, I've got to get good at that skill. Then, then there's trade execution and getting skillful at the pattern recognition of whatever your entry or strategy is. So, for example, at the moment, I've got five or six possible markets. I'm flat at the moment, but I've got five or six possible trades. So I'm uber clear on what I need to do in that 10 or 15 minutes in the morning in the evening in terms of placing the trade. And then lastly, just get into the habit of journaling and collecting data. If you did those three things and somebody listening might go, well, I don't really clear on my strategy. Well, OK, so you need to get clear on what your strategy is by testing it and being happy with that. But I would say they're the three things that I get my guys is get good at your analysis. That's your that's your craft. So you can look at any market and determine whether it fits the particular type of condition that you trade in. Then get good at actually physically placing the trade and reordering your possible trade list and honing in on when you need to place the order and then get good at data collection i filling in your whatever whatever form of trade spreadsheet you use to track your trades and your journal 
there you've only got three things you need to think about. If you've got more than three things to think about or focus on, then it becomes less easy, becomes much harder to be effective at any of them because you're spreading yourself too thin. So that's a good way of checking in is, am I trying to focus on more than three things? And it, I'm only going to do one thing at once, but I only really want three skills at maximum that I'm focusing on as a whole. And then I'm like, right, okay, those three things are going to take time and application to get better at. And then I review each one on its own, and then I review all of them as a whole in terms of the dice that I work with. Yeah, that feedback loop is definitely so important for traders, for sure. Yeah, and I think this, the, the, it's and it's the it's the quality of the feedback as well. It's the type of feedback, the quality of the feedback, um, when it happens. And I think sometimes traders are lo are looking around for too many too many pieces of feedback. One of the things that I ask my guys to do when they come on um, for the the four week training I do with them is say, right, okay, for the next four weeks, you're only allowed one other information source than me. So just for these four weeks, after the four weeks, you can go back to the 150 people that you're following, but you're only allowed one other information source. Just to give your brain a chance, not saying that there aren't other good things out there or what I'm saying is, is the holy grail or right. By no means am I saying that. What I'm saying is for you, for the next four weeks, just have some focus, maybe another podcast, maybe something else, but don't. But the thing I see is you know, people are on 150 email lists. They're hearing about every different super strategy that's out there. And that's just frying their brains. It's tough because people, especially traders, have different opinions, different styles of trading and different ways to do things. And if you want to like find the one way that works, you're going to have all these ways that you could do and these patterns you could look at. And it becomes very hard to trade if you have like all these patterns you see on the chart, but you're not trading them. It's like things that go against your trade. So you're not sure if you take the trade or not. And it just becomes a, a whole mess at that point. And it's understanding you as a trader. I think there's a, there is a, there's a fine balance between overcoming adversity and saying, right, I'm going to, I'm going to focus primarily on breakouts. Um, and let's say, for example, so for me, I breakout patterns. I don't like, I don't trade them. I don't want to. Yeah. I work with people that feel the need that even though they're not succeeding at a breakout pattern within their whole framework, they feel they've got to get good at it. And I'm like, you don't need to get good at it. There are other ways that you can trade within a market and your stats are showing that you're actually better at this so it's a fine line between overcoming adversity and trading something that you're struggling with versus just going oh well i'm no good at that and walking away it's a fine line between putting in the work but realizing the whole sunk cost fallacy is that well i've spent all this time learning about this particular model or method i've got to keep going with it now that isn't that doesn't tend to be the problem I face because of the amount of information that's out there. People tend to, if there was one problem, I think I see is they're chopping and changing. But also on the other end of the scale, there are some people that will try something and it's not working for them, and actually they do need to make a make a shift. And not everybody's the same. People trade in different ways, and I think that's there's so much out there, and there's also it's also an understanding yourself as well. Good point for sure. Uh, a question I get a lot, which I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on this. So. Let's say someone want to trade 30 different markets with their strategy. Will they actually go and like test all these 30 markets, like back test all of them to see they have an edge on them? Or is it more like a, do you favor more like a live feedback approach where they get feedback from their, their trading, either demo or live, and based on this, they can cut market or add new things or kind of like play with it? Oh, uh, I, I, the, the reason I'm smiling is we actually, last night we were actually having this discussion in one of our, in one of our sessions. And I'm very much, um, if I go back, if I go back six or seven years, um, the, one of the biggest challenges when I was, when I was coaching people was that they, a lot of people wouldn't do any backtesting. Um, and they would, and they, and they would go, well, you've got all the data for the strategies I'm going to trade, Ali. Why would I, why would I go, why'd I go and trade them? Fair enough. So that's one extreme. But I think what I've realized now is that actually going out and live, physically live trading the strategy straight away, I actually think is good. Now there's a caveat to your listeners. Yeah, if that if that's on a demo account, great. But I I think you you want to want to go out with your the, the full stake that you're planning on trading because you haven't got the experience, you're not necessarily got the data. But going away and trading straight away, what I found is there are certain things that come up when you're in the mix, whether it's the way you analyze the market, the way you the way you trade the market that you simply don't get from testing. Excuse me, and I think. 
And also you're more motivated. So I've seen this with traders is they go through, you've got a strategy, they like the look at it, it's got a, they've tested it on two or three markets. I'm like, right, go live with it, even if it's a demo account, go live with it now. And then when it's gone through a drawdown, they're actually more motivated to go and back test because they want to know whether or not that drawdown is typical or normal. So yeah, I'm very big at getting live with the strategy as soon as you can. Not not you're not taking your ten thousand dollars that you've allocated to trade with and risking full stake. Go in with a demo. It's not it's not to create the illusion of you making money. It's that so that you can experience what it's like to test that theory real time. But the premise is that you're building the data in the background. So I think the, the best is a combination of the two. I'm working with a gentleman at the moment now, and he's doing exactly that. And he said for about a year, he was intending to do back testing, getting five or six back tests done a week. Now that he's gone out live with the strategy, because he's te- he got two markets tested, he now wants to know what the other markets would, would offer and wants to know what the whole experience is because he's now he's now demo trading in room. And I've got a couple of guys that are, that are trading on very minimal stakes. On strategy so i think a combination of two works really well and i do that now i've got a new idea and i'm actually i'm actually um demo trading that new idea you could paper trade it but being in being in with that concept real time is very different than scrolling back or using auto auto scroll it's something your brain does something different when you're when you're doing it there and then yeah it's totally a good point and the wrong way to go about it would be to just go live on like a big account and start to trade like because you want to make money that's the wrong way to do it but if you can at least trade with like a small account or like you said demo and test things out and kind of get some more feedback and then go test it then yeah definitely way to i definitely like that, that answer it's a good one is there anything we didn't talk about or focus on you want to mention or, or talk about i think that uh, what i again i like what's great coming on you know with uh, having a brain coming on is there's always there's always stuff going on i think one of the big things that I'm I'm really doing with trade with, with with traders at the moment is getting them to really own what it is they do, which is a little bit on the lines of what we've talked about. You know, um, we could we could talk about trading for hours, but we might not actually. And I have this with other traders, I know we might not actually get into the detail of how the actual nitty gritty of how I trade versus how you trade, because if you own your trading process and your trading strategy you're less concerned about what the trader next to you is doing. So yes, you can learn and you can maybe go into that detail and pick little bits up. But one of the things I'm saying to my guys is get to the point where you really feel that you own what it is you do. So you have the combination of live trading data, live trading track record gives you that live trading data. You have back tested data. You, you are confident in that strategy. You are happy when that strategy goes through a losing period, and I say you're not joyful, but you're okay. You're not you're not happy and excited, but you're like, yep, this is part of what this strategy does. And then you don't get overly excited when the strategy is going through a big winning period. So you're able to balance that pendulum and uh, and I, I and measure those elements of ownership. So I don't need I don't need anybody else's trading strategy. I'm comfortable with the way I trade. Now, there'll be a period when I'm losing and another trader's winning and you might go, oh, it'd be nice to be up at the moment or vice versa. You'll be up and they'll be they'll be going through a drawdown period. But for me, that that's a, a thing I'm really pushing because there's so many great things out there at the moment in terms of information. You've got all the funded, funded accounts. But I say to traders, really, really make sure you own what you're doing. You're not being driven to try and make 10% in one month and you've, you've, you've got no trading experience, you're not being, you're not, you're, you're, you're really honing in on what your strategy and what your process is. I think that's a, that's a big thing, especially with, as we've discussed, with all the information that's out there. And um, there isn't one way to do it, but I do think if you can hone your way to do it long term, that's going to, that's going to, that's going to help. Yeah, this is a really good point. The only way I was able to get possible was kind of having my own, my own strategy, becoming a master at it and kind of creating my own, my own thing. It's just like when you don't know the strategy, when it's someone else's strategy, you pick from somewhere else, like online. It's like you don't know how to improve it. You don't know when it's going to come to a drawdown. You don't, you don't know the stats of it. Uh, you have no clue like what works, when it works, when it doesn't work. And it's just really hard to understand like the whole premise behind it. And being able to know what you need to do at, 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 at any time to make it better or to change it or, or whatever. So uh, it's definitely a tough place to be in. So definitely make it your own for me made a, a really big difference. 
Awesome. So with that being said, where can people connect with you or, or kind of find out more about the work you do if they want to connect or, or learn more from you? Yeah, they can search me social media, Ali Crooks, or the full name, Alastair Crooks. Uh, Trader Support Club is where they can come along. Uh, head to the website, so it's just www.traders with an S, supportclub.com. Um, they can access a whole a load of free information and they, and everybody gets to sign up as a free member. And then as a free member, I will be put, I put on um, at least quarterly, uh, quarterly trainings for free. Um, you'll be the first to know about any other trainings that we do. We have our charts and brokers program, which is completely free. You can come on and set your charts up in exactly the same way that we do. Again, that's not to say that you would trade in exactly the same way. But again, I see a lot of traders with too much, too much stuff on their charts. Um, and there's a whole other set of free training materials in there as well. So you can come trade a support club, check us out. And then obviously you can message us anytime if you've got any questions or if you want to get more involved with us at a more personal level. Awesome. I'll make sure to put the link below the, the video here. People can check it out directly and click those links. And the podcast channel is available to directly access your website, tradersupportclub.com. Awesome. Thank you, Ali. It's been a good discussion as always. I know we covered a bunch of different topics. All wave is cool. Uh, cool to go on like different tangents here. So I appreciate the advice to give to my listeners and hopefully we can talk again and catch up in a few months. That would be cool. Brilliant. Etienne, thanks for having me.